Welcome to Brain and Levat. We're going to be talking about one of the world's most famous philosophers, Hilary Putnam, with the editor of a new book on some of Putnam's greatest works. We're going to be talking about Putnam's work in moral philosophy. Mario DeCaro, would you like to start with some thought experiments? So in this essay, in this book, nice cover, Hilary Putnam talks about two thought experiments that are classic, but he uses them together. So the first one is this. Let's assume that there is a terrorist who has a big bomb and could kill a lot of people, but we don't know what this bomb is. And so should we torture him in order to know where the bomb is and so to disconnect it? The intuition that Patnam has is that we shouldn't do that. We should think about other possibilities like uh, threatening the person that will torture him or her, and um, trying to use some medicines or products that could help us to get the truth. Uh, anyway, the idea that uh, torture is acceptable is something that for Patrama shouldn't be done. So this shouldn't be done. The, because the idea that torture is acceptable is so terrible that really shakes our mo deepest into moral intuitions. Now, the point is that from a strictly consequentialist point of view, so the family of moral views that look at the consequences of actions in order to evaluate their morality, it may be that the conclusion should be that we should torture them. So, for example, utilitarian is the most famous version of this family of views. That it, it, this is the idea that a, a, an action is moral if the general benefits for society would be higher than the other possible actions. So because many people could die because of the bomb, it seems that torturing the people is little sufferance compared with the death of many people. So a consequentialist story, utilitarian could say, yes, we should torture him. And this for Patnam is unbearable. There are versions that Patnam doesn't mention because for him, this is enough, but that even the thought experiment can be made a little more harsher. Let's assume that the, the terrorist is crazy and says, I'll show you where the bomb is if you torture that little child. This is even worse, of course. But from the utilitarian point of view, still the sufferance of a little child is much less than the death of many people. So again, a, uh, someone who looks at the consequences of our actions as the only way you're judging the morality of those actions may conclude that, yes, it's okay to torture the child. All this, Patram says, shows that consequentialism cannot be taken as the last word in ethics. But that doesn't mean that it has some interesting component, something we shouldn't forget in some cases. Because Patram's view in ethics is a pluralistic approach. We have different intuitions. We live in different situations. So we really need to every time to think deeply when we have this kind of difficult decisions to make and use all the intellectual tools we have. One, maybe consequentialist, but up to a point. So many other people go in the other direction, the opposite direction and say, look, an action is moral as long as it is inspired by the right principles. The right principle could be the Ten Commandments, for example, or some other religious uh, law. But the typical example, the philosophical example is this categorical imperative by Kant that says that you shouldn't ever use the other people as tools for reaching your own ends. And so you should respect the other person always as an end in itself. That's the idea. But also here, Patnam has a counterexample that they say actually classic. So let's assume that you hide a person. The classical example is a Jewish person during World War II, and then there are Nazis or fascists at your door asking, are you hiding somebody? And now, according to <coughs> Kant, to the categorical uh, imperative, you shouldn't lie because lying is treating someone 
as a means for something else, like, for example, saving the other person's life. You are not respecting the humanity of the person in front of you, even if he's a Nazi. So Kant has this very controversial little essay in which he says, we shouldn't ever lie. But we have, this is just one case. Should we really sacrifice the life of a person and possibly even ours? Because we are hiding that person for the sake of the categorical imperative. It seems to pattern that this is not the case, that there are situations in which some principle that seems correct in themselves can actually be suspended for a little while. And this is one case. So again, it seems that these two universalistic ethics, so ethics that pretend to have a recipe for every situation don't work because there are exceptions and you, we have to be conscious of this. So neither looking at the consequences all the time, nor at the principle that inspire our actions all the time is enough for being sure that we know what is to behave morally. We have to be much more flexible. That's bottom point of view. So as a diehard utilitarian over here, it's, it's very hard not to start giving responses for the utilitarian and trying to find a solution in the terrorist case. But before we go down that road, instead of trying to fix consequentialism or fix deontology, how do you combine these theories? So how do you form a pluralistic ethics in a way that's not just vague? Because that is my concern is that what you will then do is in any given situation, you won't turn to the theory, you'll turn to your intuition and say, well, this is what I'd like to do. And then you'll just pick the theory out of the group that works for you out of the plurality that gives you the justification for the decision you want to make and say, well, there you go. That's what we should do. But it, then it seems like the theory is not guiding your actions, that your intuitions are guiding the theory. Yeah, that's a good question. But the point is that you need to give reasons for your actions. So it's not that just your feelings, right? You feel that this is what you do. Now I am follow the categorical imperative. Now I'm a utilitarian and that's it. No, the idea is that we should justify our actions by giving reasons, at least potentially, we should be able to give reasons. And the, the crucial point for Patram is that arguing in ethics is not too dissimilar from arguing about rational fields as science, for example, or about describing the world, right? When you describe the world, you try to be correct uh, and so on with ethics. We have standards there. So standard of consistency, standard of respect of some intuitions that are universally shared. So for example, there are intuitions that Patram believes everyone has, that there is the saddest or there is the sociopath, but we shouldn't model our ethics on these cases. So for example, torturing children, especially for fun, is something that nobody ever should consider uh, ethical. That's uh, a principle. So it's not that for Patram there are no rules at all, but there are no meta rules that say all the time what we should do in any case, but in single situation, this is correct. This is what we should do to appeal to intuitions that are common. And also another point with Patram that's very important and it's controversial, but I think it's correct. And many people think it's correct uh, is that there is such a thing that is uh, moral progress. That's very important. So our competence in ethics has improved in the course of history. Let's take Aristotle, great mind, perhaps the greatest mind of history in ever appeared on the earth. Famously, Aristotle defended slavery on a, actually an elitist basis. So some people are born to be slaves. Some people are born to be masters. Now, it would be unfair to say that Aristotle was immoral because he defended slavery, because everyone at Aristotle's times thought that uh, slavery was okay, was an okay institution. Most people thought they was based on the idea that if you are a prisoner of war, then you are a slave. Aristotle had a different idea, idea of who should be a slave, not the prisoner of war, but the person who was born inferior. So he had this racist view, but these were common views. So we shouldn't say, oh, we shouldn't read 
Aristotle because he was a real. Some time people go so far, but I think it's wrong. It would be different, however, if someone defended slavery nowadays, because there has been progress. Nowadays, no one can rationally def and morally defend an institution as hateful as slavery. We have learned that. Everyone does. So the idea that there are cultures in which uh, things are different from ours. Yeah, but there are also universal standards. There is moral progress. We can talk with people that have different ideas. Uh, sometimes we learn by talking with others. Sometimes the other learn. Perhaps we don't always reach an agreement, but at least we, in discussion, this book is called In Dialogue. Dialogue is the most important thing for Patron, even in ethics. So think about hot bioethical issues like euthanasia or abortion. Even when you talk with the other, who someone who has a very different idea from you, even if the differences are deep, if there is good faith, you learn something from the other. At least you learn that their view perhaps is not absurd, even if it's different from yours. And this makes it possible to go next to each other. This kind of process, right? Trying to understand the other, trying to offer the best reasons to you have, trying to reach an agreement. This is exactly what happens with rational uh, discussion in general, not just in ethics. Every time we discuss rationally, we discuss in this way. So I want to get a bit of clarity then. If the claim is that morality is like science, there are a set of, let's say, scientific laws that govern the nature of our universe. And maybe there's some areas where we go, we're not quite sure how things work. We're not sure how you tie up subatomic particles and regular particles, but we know how the theory of gravity works and everyone can agree to it. It seems like, as you point out in the beginning, that we have a series of different competing moral intuitions so that we think consequences matter. We also think that rights matter. And the question is then, how do you avoid Jason's objection, which is instead of just going, well, I've got the smorgasbord of principles and whichever one I can use can generate a certain result for me that doesn't seem counterintuitive. So if I don't want to torture the kid, I appeal to rights. If I don't want to let the Nazis come in, I appeal to consequences. But that's not how the scientist operates. The scientist says there is a law of nature, and whether I like it or not, that's the one that applies. So if you think that consistency matters, and Putnam thinks consistency matters, then you've got to be consistent in the application of your principles. You can't just pick and choose. You've got to say, well, these are the things that we utilize under all cases. And it seems like you have to bite a bullet at some point, or else you're either biting a bullet about which moral principle you use in a particular case, or you're biting a principle on consistency and saying, I don't need to be consistent on this case. Yeah, I wasn't thinking about the case in which a scientist would defend uh, the idea that the Copernican system has to think to some crazy person who thinks that the heart is flat, because this is not the case. I'm discussing situations in which people talk about controversial issues in science. Otherwise, there is no discussion, of course, there is nothing to discuss really. It's to teach. Someone is the teacher, some other one is the learner, period. No, that's not the case. I'm talking about when we argue uh, because we want to prove a point, a, a controversial point. This is the similarity is this one. When we try to find an agreement when there are different rational positions. And that's exactly what happens in science. People don't talk about things on which everyone agrees. I mean, unless one of the two is a little loomy, but and then, what, what, <laughs> when we talk is there are two points of view and you try to decide which is the best. And this is similar to what happens in morality. Perhaps in asymmetry is this, Patram says, there are these principles in science that we cannot find so strongly in ethics. So the idea that Patram has that normally when we act rationally in moral discussion, we try to find solutions to problems without having a safe recipe. But this is not just the case with the ethics. When we discuss about sport or ethics, we proceed exactly in the same way. Sport, ethics, politics, uh, or where to go to vacations. We don't have safe rules. And we have to invent our own rules in, the, in each particular situation. In this sense, perhaps, Patanam is closer to Aristotle, some point of Aristotle's ethics that is more particular. So, you have to learn how to deal in situations. To Aristotle talked about virtues, which virtue to use in different situations, and the practical wisdom. So practical wisdom is the ability to decide 
when it is a conflict of virtues, for example, in Aristotelian terms, how to proceed. You do this by learning through experience and uh, being inspired by persons that you consider wise. This is more similar to what Patra Masaya thinks, even if he doesn't talk about virtues. He talks about his capacity of arguing and discussing and thinking, being open-minded. So what I worry about is that if you don't have this recipe, that some of the notions that you talk about won't be given the status that they should. So let me be more specific. So you talk about moral progress. What would that mean? What would moral progress mean when you say that we are able to reason better morally now than we did in centuries past? Then I'd want to know according to what standard. And then you're going to say, well, it's not utilitarianism. It's not, it's not deontology. It's some combination of them. And, and, and I'd say, okay, but explain that combination. Like, what are the rules? Is it in any given situation an action is right? If and only if it's either maximizes utility or it conforms with all the duties of the agent and treats everyone as an end in themselves. Is it an or? Is it an and? It must be both. It must be both. It must maximize utility and respect everyone. Or is it some sort of limiting condition? So is it that we should, we should always act according to our duties, but so long as horrendous consequences don't ensue. So I just want to know the exact configuration. Did Putnam have something to say about that? Yeah. Okay. Let's assume the first that there are some issues on which we know now, perhaps we have always known that these are things that we shouldn't done or things that we should do in some particular cases. So torturing a child is an acceptable period. Doesn't admit any exception. So it's not that there are no things that we are not sure about, but these are not very many. In most cases, we don't know exactly what is the moral things to do. There are conflicts. Even if one, people can be bad faith, but even if one is in a good faith, simply you don't know which one is the moral attitude. So think about this, a person is very, is sick. Should you tell them how sick they are, or you should be a more compassionate not to tell them. I don't think there is any rule there. I don't think we need a rule. It would be a mistake to think that in these situations, you need a universal rule that tells you how to behave with that person. But also an example of moral progress, the most obvious, the scope of morality, who are they? entities who should be subjected to our moral interest. So at the beginning, it was just us and our family and some friends. But of course, men counted more than women and uh, white people more than other people. But now this is unacceptable. So all humanity count the same. But at the same time, the circle, as Peter Singer says, has broadened even more. Now in the circle, there are animals and the environment as such. Even if, think about it, in our moral progress, now we consider something that people hadn't thought for many millennia, next generations. So entity, people that don't exist yet, we have some moral commitments toward them. We have to respect them, even if they don't exist. Even if we don't behave correctly, perhaps they will never exist. But still, for this reason, we have to respect them. This is moral progress. Have we done this moral progress by obeying consequentialism or Kantianism? I don't think so. We have proceeded by trial and errors. That's the way we do. I don't think uh, this kind of progress is done following one law. Science doesn't work this way. The idea that there is one method in science is totally wrong. There is not one method in science, not two methods, not three methods. There is an unlimited number of methods. Why should there be a method in ethics? So for some further clarity, I wonder about this. It seems that, as you say, there's a widespread consensus on a range of moral topics that there wasn't always a consensus on. So it used to be the case that a lot of people thought slavery was okay, that you only owe duties to, as you say, members of your group, and that those intuitions have been shed. And whichever moral theory you plug in, they're going to be compatible with those other intuitions. And then we have these other cases, these hard cases where we say there's a tension here. So we generally think lying is bad, but we want to justify it in some cases. We generally think torture is wrong. And either you say it's always wrong, regardless of the consequences, or you say, look, sometimes you got to kill a kid uh, to appease the terrorists so that hundreds of thousands of people aren't killed by the nuclear weapon. You kind of lean these things. So I, what I wonder about is, 
with regards to the consensus, do we just say, look, whichever moral theory you pick, you're going to get to these results. And so it doesn't matter which one you use. It's a matter of taste. So it's just like, what do you want for dinner tonight? Asparagus or chocolate? And you want to go to Italy or South Africa? Matter of taste. Whichever moral theory you pick, it's just a matter of taste. Then do we say, okay, on the controversial stuff, where we've got these clashes, now it's not just a matter of taste. Now there's stakes on the table and it matters which one you pick. And do we just say, we don't know which one is correct? It's a knowledge problem. Maybe there is some theory that would explain everything out there in the universe, some like ultimate unifying moral theory, like that scientists are in search of. Or is it to say, no, it doesn't exist. And we just sort of muddle our way through it. Is there some kind of clarity that Putnam reaches on this front? I wonder how seriously that you can reject relativism as a normative theory, but maybe on some ontological level, you go, look, I'm not a moral realist. We're just sort of pushing our way through with things that look like taste. And we hope that the world operates in some more efficient manner, but there's no true state of moral affairs or is it that there is, and we're just trying to discover it. Yeah. Even about taste, I think there are limits. If I compare my wine taste with Robert Parker's taste, there is an objective standard. It's not a question of my own taste is like his. So even in taste, there are some standards mm. and as to ethics, first of all, we should say that Patrama certainly is not a relativist, but he is a fallibilist. So he's a fallibilist about human knowledge in general. All our knowledge may be false. We may be wrong, but we need reasons to think that we are wrong. So our scientific theories may easily be wrong, but if at some point someone finds that a part of the universe where there is something that is faster than the speed of the light, and the theory of Einstein's theory would be falsified. There is no a priori argument that this cannot happen. So we have to be open to the idea that all our beliefs are wrong. Even if we need the arguments, when they are well supported by our reasons, uh, we need reasons to doubt them. This is the difference between fallibilism and skepticism. The skeptic uh, doubt a priori. Okay, I doubt your view. No, the fallibilists only doubt when there are reasons to doubt, but assume that our beliefs can be wrong. And this is also true for ethics. But as it happens in all the other fields, our best ideas in ethics, we should accept them even if we know that they may be wrong. So as long as we have good arguments, we are not just entitled, we have a cognitive and a moral duty to accept the best ideas we have, the best theories we have until they're proven wrong. So this could be called an inference to the best explanation. Let's take, uh, let's accept for true the best explanations we have. This is what happens in science. The same could be for ethics, right? So we have this view that we should respect animals. We shouldn't torture animals and we shouldn't accept uh, deep discriminations among humans. These are our views, perhaps they may be proven wrong, but in order to prove wrong these ideas, a radical change in our worldview should happen. And why should we accept the idea that this is under the corner? I know that below the corner, I don't think it's so close. You've said that Putnam was not a relativist about morality, but I worry that it sounds like he is. So if you're saying that we shouldn't judge Aristotle as a racist, because in his time, people were all racists and we shouldn't judge him as supporting slavery because everyone did then. Then that really does sound like relativism. And when we further insert this notion of rational discussion, I mean, Mark and I are great fans of discussion because that's what this show is about. It's about engaging, but we don't think that the truth of the matter is relative to the discussion. In other words, we don't think that just because we come to a consensus on the show and suppose the show just did, didn't just have the three of us that had every rational being on the show and we have a long discussion about a particular issue let's say it's abortion or euthanasia we have a long discussion about it we come to a consensus we don't think therefore that that is correct we just think that the rational discussion is a route to help us perhaps get closer to the truth it's better than no discussion but we don't think that the discussion itself constitutes the truth I agree entirely. It's not the constitution of the truth. I think that the partner would agree, and I agree that it talks about a 
truth or approximation to the truth. So if we find some argument very compelling, we should accept it. And if we don't see reason to doubt it, we should accept it, but we should always stay fallibilist. So uh, let's assume that the three of us now find an incredible moral theory. We are all convinced we can accept it and think it's true, but probably as soon as we go out from the room, our respective rooms, someone will prove that it wasn't so solid. So that's how it works. But one point about relativism, the fact that we say that Aristotle was an immoral because Aristotle didn't have the conceptual tools to understand that slavery is immoral in the sense that it would be crazy to say that Aristotle was irrational because he didn't believe that the herd moved. We cannot say that. It's a question of a historical approach. So of course there is a, in some sense, rel historical relativism, but also there is progress. So we know better than Aristotle. So if we have to compare the two views, we say that we are better, but this doesn't mean that we can criticize uh, Aristotle for not doing what he couldn't do. So it's a very different issue. So I'd like to turn to a related topic, which is Putnam's work in the arena of political philosophy. So we've talked a lot about this idea of not knowing for certain what's true. And if we think about Rawls's idea that you should have a democracy that can support a range of different positions, that you want to be pluralist, that people are going to disagree about values in a way that's, that are reasonable. Think about Habermas's view that we should have a deliberative democracy, that people should be speaking their ideas out in a contested way with different levels of representatives at a community level, at, at a national level to try and find out what's true, to work out what the best laws are, and this is always under revision. What were Putnam's views on the topic? Putnam changes political views dramatically. In the late 60s, early 70s, he was a Maoist, and he was famously disruptive at Harvard, so he interrupted other colleagues' lessons, the leading groups of students entering there and trying to start a new discussions about politics when perhaps someone was teaching, I don't know, medieval law. And uh, so at some point he was almost kicked out of Harvard. He was the only case in history of Harvard where a tenure professor was almost kicked out. He was saved by Quine. Quine was very conservative. And so he didn't agree with the Maoist ideas that Patton had, but respected him deeply. So, so at that point he was a Maoist, then he became a radical, more conventional radical, but then eventually he was, a, I would say, a traditional liberal. So has similar ideas to Rawls, uh, Habermas, or Scaland, and uh, it was all, uh, I remember, yeah, the last time I met him, he was very worried that Trump could win the elections. He was extremely worried about Trump. So he was a traditional liberal, was very, very interested in politics, perhaps with Habermas, had an issue about Habermas formalism. So it's not just a question of respecting the forms. Democracy has to go deeper than that. And I remember these discussions with him actually. So he said things you can expect from a liberal. So he was against that penalty, against limiting violently the immigration and all these things. And it was a democratic, but also he saw the crisis of democracy, uh, the crisis of democracy. Uh, cause, for example, died money, the huge amount of money that can condition uh, electoral campaigns and uh, corruption and all these things. So when he died, he was sincerely worried about the state of democracy in America and in, and in the world. So how should we approach political science according to Putnam? Should we also have a dialogue? So should we have dialogues between today, it would be the right and the left to try and find some sort of solution in the middle, or is the solution on one side? So you mentioned he was more of a liberal. Would he say that dialogue is unnecessary because the right has it wrong? Look, uh, good question. When I he say that dialogue, I also say you should respect the other. You should talk with them and perhaps you will change your mind. But on some things, Patram would change his mind. That penalty is unacceptable and uh, discrimination is unacceptable and uh, all these things. So these are, uh, limits that you cannot pass, but still, if you talk with people that don't respect these things, so you should try to convince them. I see exactly again, in, in any rational 
a discussion, right? Sometimes we are both confused and that's a situation in which the dialogue is very easy, right? Because no one has a, an alleged truth to impose. But when you believe sincerely in what you believe, it's not that you are going to give it up because the other doesn't agree with you. But you have to discuss in a good way, in a rational way. Patnam was actually one of the, that's probably the smartest person I have ever met. It was difficult to talk with Patnam paradoxically because he understood what you were trying to say. He reformulated his or with his own words before you really spoke. And he already had the objection. So was, but that was the idea or any changes mind. Once we were writing, we discussed the free will. Let's say if I can uh, talk about this. Uh, so we had this idea, uh, indeterminism, uh, quantum indeterminism, quantum indeterminism, uh, is the necessary base of free will. This is an idea he took from uh, Elizabeth Haskell and he went by through the analysis of the main interpretations of the principle of indeterminacy, uh, the uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, according to the different views. And at some point I asked uh, Hillary, but the uncertainty principle is ontological or, or epistemological? And he said, no, this is irrelevant. And kept exposing his ideas that indeterminism is the basis of free will. So liber a libertarian view is called. And after one week, I received an email and he says, no, you were right. I was switching the use of uncertainty principle in the different situations. So really I abandoned my idea. And so he brought me, I had written a draft on an article we co-authored in which he changed his mind. So Hilary Batrama, one of the greatest philosophers had this very well-rooted idea, but when he heard an objection that on which he really thought about, he changed his mind. So he himself could have been the paradigm of his idea of a rational dialogue. So the structure of the book is really looking at Putnam's work over a long period of time in a vast variety of different areas. And it's him engaging with the giants of the day. We recently had Martha Nussbaum on the show to talk about disgust and one of the chapters, he engages some of her ideas. How do you understand this value of being able to engage your opponents? What is the best methodology to do that? So our purpose on the show is that we thoroughly enjoy disagreeing with our guests, even if we might privately agree with them because we think clashing swords is a very useful way to get to the truth. We also think doing it with the utmost kindness and respect is the best way to do that. So we never launch any kind of personal attacks at our guests and our views have shifted. Um, we think it's quite rare for someone to publicly change their minds, but the example that you give is a beautiful one where someone says, I've thought about it and I was wrong and I need to abandon the bad idea before I go down that track. So what do you think the kinds of right methods are to use when in dialogue with other philosophers in order to find out what's true? That's a good question, Mark. Let me make a premise. Philosophy is the only field in which disagreement is in itself a value. In other fields, think about someone talking about the mathematical proofs. Is it good or not? If you disagree, one of the two is wrong. Perhaps they are, no, in this specific case, one is right and one is wrong, but, or in science or even in common life, right? So <clears throat> it seems strange that disagreement is, is a value in itself, but this is exactly what philosophy is about. Philosophy is the attempt to solve problems and issues that are probably unsolvable. And certainly no one has ever solved them. And actually if a problem that is supposed to be philosophical is solved, it's not philosophical anymore. So truth is a really difficult issue in philosophy, what is true or not. So it seems uh, just because uh, phil uh, philosophical subjects are so elusive, I think that the fact that we disagree could also be the sign that we are looking at very difficult issues from different perspectives. So. We have talked about uh, the opposite views of Kant and the uh, utilitarians. I think Patnam has a point in saying that it's not that they are entirely correct, but they are not entirely wrong either. So there is some truth in both, some value in both views that we should consider. So in philosophy, it's difficult to find a solution. That's it, period. That view was correct, the others are not. And so the idea that we disagree, I think it's a way of saying 
look, these problems are so difficult that we need the contribution of different people with different ideas. Perhaps we enlighten. What we can do in philosophy is we enlighten problems more. It's not that we can solve them. So compare with the ancient, we know there is philosophical progress. Some people say there is not. I think there is, but not in the sense that we solve problems. We understand them better. That's the idea. We understand them better. We perhaps don't consider solutions that were proposed in the past. We pro propose other solutions, but the contributions have to be plural because there is never a very convincing solution. So I'm uh, happy with your strategy, guys. And I'm happy that you try to challenge me, even if, of course, I think you were wrong. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> So I like that definition of philosophy. That's about solving the unsolvable. And really that you don't solve it all, you just enlighten the problem. But that is the very criticism that a lot of non-philosophers have of philosophy, is that we make no progress. I understand you say there is progress, but that we are involved in an impossible task, that we will be arguing about these things forever. And if we're not, we're not actually doing philosophy. So it's like built into the definition that we will be chasing our tails to the end of time. And I just want to come back to this idea of progress, because then the question is, you say, well, we have made progress. And then suppose the critic of philosophy says, so what do you mean we've made progress? And you say, well, we've enlightened the question. And you say, well, and they say, well, what do you mean we've enlightened the question? And you say, okay, well, we've ruled out certain solutions and we've introduced others and we've deepened the discussion on each of the possible solutions. But then the critic says, but hold on, how can you even rule out certain solutions? Because if you rule out certain solutions, you must have a criterion in mind. But the criterion is what we're trying to achieve. So how can it be that we rule out a solution without knowing ahead of time the standard according to which we rule it out? Yeah, this argument is seemingly good, but I don't think it could be used also in science, right? You don't have the final theory. How can you exclude some theories? Simply because they are not consistent. They are much less elegant or simple than the others. There are many epistemic criteria to exclude theories, views, ideas, even if you don't have the final solution. The same is in philosophy. Perhaps another thing that we could add is these questions are the questions that not only philosophers ask themselves, uh, everyone does. I mean, at least the fundamental question, questions. Why are we here? How should I behave? What do I know? How do I know? These are questions that everyone faces. The fact that philosophers haven't found answers is not a, the philosopher's responsibility. Probably there are no such answers, but certainly we know better. We know better than Plato in defining knowledge. We know better than human Kant in, in a, thinking about free will. We have better concepts. So people have this idea. There is a problem. There is a solution. But then even science doesn't give this. Perhaps mathematics gives this, but science theory. So Newton didn't give any solution according to this because he was wrong. It's not true. He gave it a much better way of looking at the world than the previous theories. So I'm uh, the idea of progress, n uh, the traditional idea of progress was that progress is necessary. Progress not necessary, nor epistemically, nor morally, but still it exists. Pro it's simply the form of a development in which what happens later is can be compared with what happened before. And it's better from some interesting point of view. I, I want to pick up on something you just mentioned, if I heard correctly, is that progress is not necessarily cognitive. And I kept having that thought when you were talking about moral progress as well, is it seems to me like we just have a feeling, and yes, we have reasons for that feeling, but we have a feeling that there's certain no-nos. We don't do slavery anymore. We don't do rampant discrimination for no reason. These are just things that we don't do and we think we've made progress. But if we were to ask, well, why do we think that? Yes, you could give consequentialist reasons, you could give deontological reasons, but it sounds like for Putnam, the real reason is something non-cognitive. It's not referencing a theory. It's just this kind of common sense intuition that people have. And it sounds like that is what's driving a lot of this force to progress. Yeah, it's not just common sense because common sense, of course, is modified by scientific progress as well. So it's a combination of things. We have intuitions, we have knowledge, 
we have a culture that conditions all, but it also changes. So I don't think that even here, there is a recipe. Patnam is, and I think he's right in that, he's a pluralist in many respects. Another one is this, there is no one way of defining what is progress. There are different perspectives that you can take, but what in ethics say, one measure is improving the welfare. So the fact that people realize themselves and they talk about Aristotle, Aristotle had this idea of eudaimonia, right? So the kind of happiness, that's a vague term and a vague translation, but that's something that we should value period. And also Patnam thinks that disagreements on morality are based on two mistakes. One is that we take irrational or religious views as given and as absolutely um, unshakable. That's one thing I think is perfectly right about that. The second one is that it's a matter of ignorance. So let's take racism, people insisting on the relevance of races. That's factually wrong. Races are just a construct. We could divide people for people with the curly hair or uh, non curly hair. There are differences, of course, but they are irrelevant. And this is proved by science. So, but I'm tends to limit the relevance of science when he talks about these issues. Some people say science explains everything. That's not Patanam's view, but still science is important. It can help us in understanding issues, even moral issues. So we had Gad and Barry on the show to talk about one of the best ways to make scientific progress. And he takes the line that it's important to allow a range of different ideas because some ideas may be viewed as false but incorrectly so. And one of the examples it gives is plate tectonics. So plate tectonics was viewed as a completely fringe nuts view, but in the sixties was found to be the correct view. And he said, if there weren't people beavering away at plate tectonics, they've kind of kept this sort of strange fringe view alive. We might hold the incorrect view about how the continents were shaped. And it might be, there's another idea Joel Feinberg has in ethics. He says, you can only really um, engage with someone once you know what their position is. So you can argue with the utilitarian using utilitarian principles. There's no point in saying to them, utilitarianism is wrong. Here's the Kantian argument for why you ought to refrain from doing what you're doing. It's going to fall on deaf ears. So you can have these different silos and you might be able to make progress within the silo. So utilitarianism has refined over time. There's different accounts of whether we should think about pain or pleasure or desire satisfaction or what counts as utility, how broad it should be, who should be included in the net. And you can have all this kind of progress and you might end up having a consensus among utilitarians as to what the best version of the account is. We then wind up with a series of rivaling silos. And there we say, we're not sure. It seems like these are the best contenders. And at this point, we must be agnostic as to which one is true, but they all get us very far down the road. You then have someone like Derek Parfit, who in What Matters says, well, maybe these three big theories can be understood in terms of each other, that they're these three separate ways to climb the mountain, but they're actually translatable in terms of each other's terms, and that all moral problems can be resolved through some kind of universal system. And that's an interesting way to try and take the silos and join them together and then try and get to a universal outcome. You know, I'm not sure if Parfit succeeds in this project. He does it through a process of testing intuition. So the book is just filled with thought experiments, uh, which he tries to solve using all the grand moral theories and says, you'll get to the same kind of answer, regardless of which one you use. And you can see the theories as hurdles, as part of the same race. Once you jump over all three hurdles, you get to the right answer. And so it might be that you can have this pluralist approach that ultimately converges into one kind of final ultimate approach. I think that's a fascinating debate. So why should we assume that there is certainly one way in which these discussions should be rationalized? Perhaps there is not, or perhaps as uh, Parfit was saying, there will be at the end, one way of perhaps a supercomputer will find a way of explaining everything, even at that level, we have to be open on that. But the important thing is that we keep discussing the important thing of this philosophy that is not appreciated enough, it perhaps is not appreciated enough anymore, is that it teaches that we should keep discussing, even when we don't know really what the final answer is. Discussing when you know the truth, really, uh, it's the one thing. Discussing when you have ideas, but if you are an honest philosopher, you know that they may be wrong, that's enriching. That's uh, really something that should be learned more in schools, for example. 